Where do we come to these terms, antiviral, antibacterial, uh, antiparasitic? What is it that makes an herbal author, for example, put that type of herbal action in their property listings for that herb? Well, I would say one example of that would be just based on tradition based on the fact that that herb has traditionally been used uh, for a variety of infectious states. Um, you know, bone set has classically been used for a multitude of viral infections from dengue fever to influenza and many viral infections in between that tend to produce fever. Wormwood, a traditional remedy used for, you know, parasitic infections of the GI tract. Um, uh, Spilanthes, an herb classically used for the treatment of fungal type infections. So there's one aspect of it of the herb has been used for those types of infections. Therefore, it's called antifungal or antiviral. Uh, another approach for this is based on scientific studies. And I think this is something worth looking at in a little bit more detail because when we consider scientific analysis of plants, what commonly occurs are uh, uh, jumps, jump, various jumps to conclusions, um, jumping to conclusions. Uh, when we think of the way an herb is studied uh, in the context of science, Oftentimes what we find is that when an herb is being studied for its anti-effects, more often than not, this is done through a particular constituent of the herb, berberine, for example, uh, against certain type of microbe in a Petri dish. Okay, so you culture a certain bacteria in a Petri dish and you put berberine on it and see, does the berberine, you know, reduce the, the load or the amount of bacteria culture in that, in that Petri dish? If it does, so they'll say, oh, this herb is antibacterial. And then what ends up happening is are the jumps to conclusion. So berberine killing a certain bacteria in a Petri dish does not necessarily translate to organ grape root having a systemic effect from oral ingestion of the whole plant, right? The, you see there's like multiple jumps of logic that occur there. Like really what the berberine in the Petri dish does is says if you, if you have that bacterial infection and you put pure berberine directly on the site of infection, that would be a good conclusion from a scientific study like that. But to say, oh, now you can ingest that herb internally and it will kill that bacteria, we can't do that, right? And especially uh, jumping from an isolated constituent to using the whole plant. A really good example of this would be, well, I would say that the antiviral property as a whole <laughs> um, is a really good example of this, but one, one would be glycerizin. So glycerizin from licorice root um, uh, has been studied uh, as having antiviral activity. What is true though, unfortunately, about glycerizin is that it is very poorly absorbed into the bloodstream that very little ingested glycerizin from licorice root actually gets into the blood and therefore does not have a systemic effect. So what happens in science is that they'll take glycerizin, they'll study it, show that it has an effect on say herpes simplex virus or shingles is one way uh, licorice root is used topically, right? And they say, oh, Glycerizin from licorice root kills shingles virus. And then they say, okay, now licorice root is antiviral. So now antiviral gets placed in a licorice monograph, for example. And now someone reads that 
and they go, oh, I have influenza or the common cold, which is a viral infection. Therefore, I should take licorice and it's gonna kill the virus. This does not work, okay? And this is what I like to think of as the, the antiviral myth. This is a major, major misnomer in herbal medicine because just because something kills one virus doesn't mean it kills all viruses. In fact, there's no such thing as a broad spectrum antiviral substance. And this is true of plants. This is true of, you know, uh, you know pharmaceutical medications. And this, this, this has a lot to do, without getting too in-depth on it, but this has to do with, you know, the, the morphology of a virus, that they're all very different. They all have different underlying um, structures and functions and way that they're formed, different um, ways in which their RNA structures are and things like that, because a virus technically doesn't have a DNA of its own, from my understanding. So... They're, they're all different. Whereas bacteria, there is such thing as a broad spectrum antibacterial because bacteria have at their core uh, a, a similar fundamental morphological structure in which one substance can act on many of them. The, the same is not true for antivirals. A really good example of this is as lemon balm, right? Melissa, a lot of people See, if you look at a lot of modern monographs on lemon balm, it'll say antiviral. Well, what's that based off of? Well, that's based off of, again, research, petri dish research on herpes. And Melissa, and not just Melissa too, like most of the mint family, most of the volatile oils uh, in the mint family will have a degree of activity against herpes simplex virus. This is where you'll see lemon balm putting creams and the essential oil being used for cold sores and herpes lesions and things like that. Um, but then people think, oh, Melissa is antiviral. So then they use it for their cold and they use it for their uh, flu or whatever. And uh, it's just, it's not, right? It's not going to kill influenza virus. It's, there's no research to support that with Melissa. Now, Melissa is a bit diaphoretic, right? Uh, it can be very helpful in febrile conditions. That much is true. Um, you know, it has some other aspects that can be supportive for the symptomatic picture of uh, a febrile condition, but it's not gonna kill the virus. And I think this is a really good thing to think about when you're considering this Materia Medica <clears throat> is to not, be, to be careful with over-extrapolating information when you see this type of action. Because you know, another, another example of this would be um, Lomatium dissectum. Lomatium dissectum was uh, an herb used uh, in, a cer in certain geographical regions in the United States for the, for the uh, flu epidemic in the early 1900s. And it was shown that, oh, a lot of the uh, native people were using Lomatium, weren't dying from the influenza epidemic, and some people caught on and started using it. And so Lomatium is really seen as this, you know, great antiviral for influenza. But there's actually been some studies on it showing it actually doesn't really kill the virus that well, if at all. But what is Lomatium? It's a fantastic expectorant. It's a fantastic diaphoretic. It's likely stimulating immunity. Um, it has a large amount of, of resins and volatile oils in it. Um, so it's not that it's useless for a viral infection, it's just that it may not be killing the virus itself. And this is where I feel like we have to be a little bit careful with the concept of antiviral. I think it's very important, I think, a monograph listing that says, quote unquote, antiviral on it should be a little more specific about what virus specifically is that remedy useful for and is it useful for it 
topically or internally, because a lot of that research is really the most extrapolation you can get from it would be topical application of that herb. <laughs>